Welcome to Zebulun Christian Discipleship Center. Zebulun is one of the tribes of Israel. It was known for how to fight. They can wield their, their weapons and they knew how to wield the weapons. My job is to teach y'all how to wield the word of God. Also, this is a place for real talk, for real people looking for real answers. Um, I talk about these real issues and I address them. You guys know how I am, pretty candid about things. And uh, if you get hurt, your feelings hurt by this kind of stuff, I promise you, you can grow up and you can receive and, and, and you can mature. My name is Pastor Nick. I'm a retired Marine and full-time missionary here in Okinawa, Japan. And um, tonight we're going to be talking about the laws of God, the laws of God. Um, so there I was. I was. I have to start with a story. Um, I was talking uh, to this young man who was struggling with homosexuality and uh, his friends jumped in. I mean, I was having a pleasant conversation with this guy. I mean, we we're going back and forth. He knew I wasn't condemning him. Uh, he said he was a Christian, and he said that uh, uh, he believed in the Word of God. And uh, I had just asked him, I said, um, who told you you were homosexual? And he kind of got stunned, and he's looking in my face for um, uh, condemnation. He's not going to find it. And I said, who told you that you were homosexual? You have to answer this question. Who said you were gay? And he looked around. He was looking at his friends, and he was a little awkward, so I stood between his friends and him to kind of protect him from the distraction. And uh, uh, I said, well, who said? And he said, I did, my friends did, um, the community did. And I said, D let me ask you one question. Did God say you were a homosexual? And he just began to cry and he said, no, no. And his friends, his three female friends that were sitting there, they jumped on me and they said, stop it. Yeah, that's hate speech. We love him just the way he is. God made him that way. And I honestly, I turned around to them and I told them, shut up, I'll deal with you in a second. And so I ministered to this guy and in tears, he was crying, he said, I know God didn't make me gay. And I, basically I told him, who said that and who told you that you were gay? God didn't say that. So stop listening to opinions and, and beliefs of, from other people instead of what the word of God says. And he received it and man, I prayed with him and, and he confessed his, his sins right there. He even prayed and asked God. I didn't put words in his mouth. He prayed and asked God to help him change. He, he was crying and he said, God, if you don't help me to change, I'm not going to change. I need you to help me. This is wrong. I know it's wrong. Please help me, Lord. He walked away and I turned around to his friends and uh, and I said, well, you guys were calling this, this this hate speech and you said this wasn't love. But let me ask you this. You know, what kind of friends are you? Because you guys call yourselves Christians too. What kind of friends are you to allow him, to encourage him, to condone and promote him to walk in that lifestyle? You protect him in that lifestyle. It's a sinful lifestyle. What kind of friends are you to allow that? That's not love. Love is the word of God. Love is correction. It's not, you know, condemnation, beating somebody with, with, with laws and rules. That's not what this is about at all. What is love? That's what I'm going to get to. What is love versus what is his law? And so I told his friends, I said, you know, you, you don't love him because you didn't confront him in his sin. And you recognize that homosexuality is a sin. You were just too afraid, too prideful, maybe too ignorant. And they, they kind of received it. So um, what I've learned is that the person, honestly, this is just bottom line here. I'm going to be really quick about this. The person who loves you the most is the person who will tell you the truth. That person loves you because he's going to tell you the truth. It's like you, you don't want to hear what people feel and think. You want to know the truth of what they really feel and what they think. Um, who needs friends like that? I need someone to be honest with me. If, if my stuff is smelly, if you know my fly is down or, 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 or I'm in error, I need someone to tell me. I need help. I need eyes. W rather than just don't say nothing, not my place. I don't want to sound judgmental. These, these are big boy conversations. And so anyway, I've learned this over the years, over 20 years of ministry, 20, 24 years of ministry. I've learned this from personal experience and from dealing with people is that, and hear me closely on this, if you genuinely love people, you will tell them about Jesus and the word of God. However, if you love yourself more, you will be silent. I'll say that again. If you genuinely love people, you will tell them the truth, the word of God. You'll tell them things of Christ. But if you love yourself more, you're going to be silent. It is what it is. Let me pray for you guys. 
And so, Father, I thank you for these people right now, Lord. And I pray one Psalm 119 over them. I can't pray all of Psalm 119. There's 176 verses. But, Father, I'm just going to pray just the handful in the beginning. And so, Father, as I lift them up, I, t I thank you that these people, these men and women, these people here, they know that blessed are people of integrity who follow your instructions, Lord. Father, I thank you that these people know uh, that, that, that they're joyful those who obey God's laws and search for you with all their hearts. Father, these people will not compromise with evil and they walk only in your paths. Father, I thank you. These men and women understand that you, Father, have charged them to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, Father, that these men and women, that their action would, actions would consistently reflect your decrees, Lord. Then, Father, these men and women will not be ashamed when they compare their lives with your commands. Father, I thank you even in verse 7, you say that uh, I can pray this. I declare that these men and women learn your righteous regulations, Lord. And Father, these men and women will thank you by living the way they're supposed to, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you that me and these people, they're going to obey your decrees and, and we're going to please you, Lord. Please, Lord, don't give up on us. And Father, I thank you, Lord, in verse 9, Lord, that we all know that young people stay pure by obeying your word, Lord. Obeying your word, Lord. And Father, I thank you in verse 10, Lord. I, I pray this over us, Lord, even these people that we diligently seek you, Lord, so, so um, we don't let our our wandering ways stray from your commands, Lord. And Father, I thank you. We have hidden your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you, Father. And Father, I thank you that we praise you, O Lord, and you teach us your decrees. Father, we recite your decrees aloud and your regulations, Father. We, we, we praise them. They're on our lips. And Father, we've given, you've given these to us. And so we give you praise for these things, Lord. In verse 14, Father, we rejoice in your laws as much as in riches, Father. Your laws are, are much more, more, more valuable than riches. And Father, verse 15, I declare that these men and women will study your commandments and reflect on your ways, O God. These men and women will delight in your decrees and in your statues, O Lord, and they will never forget your word. I pray this over them in Jesus' name. Amen. So before I get started, um, I have a blog. It's uh, zcdc.wordpress.com. Go check it out. Go subscribe. Uh, there's a lot of uh, newsletters I, I, I archive out there, and uh, they're brief. Uh, they're, they're very um, popular among people because they're brief. I guess you can read one in three to five minutes. It's, it's no fluff. It's no sugarcoating. It's just bottom line stuff. So go check it out. ZCDC at dot wordpress.com. ZCDC dot wordpress.com. I also have a, a YouTube channel. It's called Yahweh Has a Son. Just type in one word, Yahweh Has a Son, and you'll see several videos out there that you can uh, go check out and subscribe to. Um... I also will have to put this out there that I am a full-time missionary out here and uh, we're in Japan, extremely expensive, extremely difficult, extremely taxing. And um, my wife and I, we're out here totally by faith. And so we, we, we continue on through generous donations and contributions from people like you. So if you benefit from anything that we're teaching or saying to you or, or counseling or ministry to, towards you, please sow back into these ministries because there's there's always people who need help and this is where we come in we make disciples um i'll post on ways to give in the comments when i'm done with this video and just be looking for ways to give straight online through uh um, our credit union to the church account or ma many of those payment apps or through christians in action uh, our missions organization so um let's jump into this the law is good go to romans 7 Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 14. And so what we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, if the law is so good, what's the problem with the law? Is the law bad? Is, you know, is it is it too high for me? Uh, what, what What's the consequences of, of the law? And because I, I, I'm going to submit that the law can become our enemy when we violate it, and we've all violated God's law. So let me read this to you. Romans 7, verse 7 reads, well, then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. Verse 8. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin wouldn't have that power. What he's saying here is that the, the um, sin in my flesh actually 
contrasted against the laws of God and illuminated sin in my life. Now I know, oh, that's a sin because one, at one time I lived, okay, uh, ignorant of the law. But when I learn the law, now my sins get exposed. Um, uh, verse 9, here it is right here. At one time I lived without understanding the law. But I, when, when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life. Now I'm guilty. There's a standard and I broke it. Uh, Ten, and I ended up dying because I sinned. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Eleven, sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. Thirteen, but how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. And verse 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for the law is spiritual and is good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human. I am a slave to sin. I'm going to stop right there and jump down to Romans 8. Jump down to Romans 8, verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Wow, that law. We overcame the law through Christ Jesus. And verse 2, And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And here's 3, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Let me read that one in the King Jimmy. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. The weakness of the law. This was the weakness of the law. So now here's 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 some, here's some questions for you. What was the weakness of the law? The law was supposed to be good. What's the weakness of the law? The weakness of the law is that it could not save us. That's the weakness. The weakness of the law, it cannot save you. And the problem is the law becomes our enemy when we violate the laws. Because now the laws demand punishment. God's laws, broken laws, demand punishment, demand real justice. And so what happens when we break the laws? We're in trouble. We're in trouble. And we, there's a debt that's, that needs to be paid. There's a, it's out of balance now. And so every sin has to be paid for. Thank God for Jesus Christ because he's the only one who can pay for your sins. If he doesn't pay for your sins, you pay for them. This is why everyone in the world needs Jesus Christ. And so what is the purpose of the law then? What's the whole purpose of the law? It can be summed up with Galatians 3.24. Go to Galatians 3, 24. This is so cool. <laughs> it says, Galatians 3, 24. It says, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith, verse 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Let me read that again. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Basically, the law was our teacher. Well, what was it supposed to teach us? Bottom line, what the law is supposed to, God's laws are supposed to teach us is that you, me, no one can perform them all. No one can do it. You cannot uphold God's laws. They're too, they're too big. They're too, we're too sinful. He's too holy and just and pure. And we're, we're wretched. We're created in sin. We were conceived in sin. And so... The law was our teacher to bring us into Christ. Well, how does the law teach us that? Honestly, what's supposed to happen, if you're being honest, you know you sin. I know I sin. And what's supposed to happen, it, it, it teaches me. I'm, I'm like, God, I keep trying. I keep trying to obey your laws, but I keep sinning. I, I, I don't want to lie. I don't want to lust. I don't want to worry. I don't want to procrastinate. I don't want to uh, worry. I don't want to uh, uh, gossip. And, and here, here, here I... I I do it all the time, and I'm trying to stop. And then what the law was supposed to teach you is that you can't do it. And it's point, what, what happens, you, you surrender and say, ah, I can't do it. 
There has to be another way. Well, that's exactly what it's saying. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. This is the whole purpose of the law is to show you that you and me, that we can't do it. And because we can't do it, we're desperate. We cry out, God, who's going to save us? We're in trouble. Christ. It points to Christ. And now we can run to Christ and say, Christ, Jesus Christ, save us, save us, save us. That's the point of the law, to show you that you can't do it. It, it gives you boundaries. And we, when you recognize that you violate those boundaries, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. And you should, oh, humility will say, I'm, I, I violated your laws, God. Who's going to save me? This is the purpose of the law. And so go back to Romans 3. I want to show you something more about the law. I'm almost done, guys. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. <laughs> it reads, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. <laughs> for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. I don't care who you are. You've sinned. I've sinned. We've all sinned. The Pope has sinned. He's not infallible. Everyone has sinned. Muslims have sinned. Homosexuals have sinned. Cheaters have sinned. Adulterers have sinned. Liars have sinned. Women, men, you know, children. We've all sinned. If you've sinned, you need Jesus because he's the only one who can pay for our sins. Your sins. And so it goes on. It says, obviously, for Romans 3.19, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, now the law is written. It's like you can speed down a highway with no posted limits, but then and you can speed and say, well, there's no speed limit. I, I didn't know. But then they put, you know, 70, 70 miles an hour. And as soon as you start exceeding 70, they say, oh, it's, it's posted everywhere. The law has been posted everywhere. It's 70 and you exceeded it. Now you broke the law. And so verse 20, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. God's ways, God's decrees, his statutes, his word shows us when we, we the contrast between his holiness and our wretchedness. We violate his laws all the time. And so this is what the whole point of the law is to show us. Let me go to Go, go forward one book, Romans 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Let's see what that says. <laughs> verse, chapter 4, verse 15. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. I'll say that again. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. We can't do it. Oh, we can't do it. Lord, we need you. I, I can't even stop worrying. I have anxiety, uh, fears. God, help me. Yeah. And then he goes on and says, the only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Basically, do away with the word of God. And then there's no laws. Yeah, he's, I'm not violating any laws. But we have God's laws. And the Bible says his laws are written on our heart anyway. And so the bottom line here is, um, go to, <laughs> we just read Romans 8, 8 3 what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. Um, can the law save us? No, the law can't save us. The law is good, it's pure, it's holy, it's just. The problem with the law is that when you break it, boom, the law demands punishment. Something has to be punished. That's why Lady Justice, if you ever look at the statues of Lady Justice out in front of our, our courthouses, most courthouses, courthouses around the world, Lady Justice is standing there and she's blindfolded um, she has a sword in her right hand and she has scales in her left hand. Now, the blindfold represents justice is blind. It doesn't matter if you're male, female, tall, short, fat, skinny, black, white. It doesn't matter. Justice is blind. Everyone gets treated fairly. Now, this, is, this, is, this is the goal of, of that statue, the message of that statue. And then the scales, they're, they're, they're there to say that when um, they're, they're even, they're equally balanced. But when somebody breaks the law, them scales get out of whack, which means somebody broke a law. And when that law is broken, that person or that, that crime has to be investigated. And we have to find out who broke that law. And when the law, we find the culprit or the, 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 the person who transgressed that law, take him to court. And what ends up happening, 
uh, he gets found guilty or whatever, and he's, he has the trial. And let's say he is guilty. Well, what happens? The judge says, "We find you guilty. Okay, we did. We we've established that you are guilty. And now, here's the punishment. Because if we find judgment says you're guilty, punishment says you got to do six years, six years in prison. And so as soon as you do your six years, boom, boom, the scales are even again. They're back to they're back to even. And so the sword that the lady justice is holding is for the punishment. If you're innocent, you go free. If you're if you're guilty, punishment. That's what all that represents. But the law couldn't save us. What saves us is faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. I'll get into another conversation about works. Um, so here's very important because I know some people get, it, it riles people up when I talk about this. Go to John chapter five because people say, well, yeah, I, I hear this a lot. What you're saying is that yeah, the, you know, the, the grace of God is so big that, that the, the people can sin and continue to be saved. And I didn't say that at all. You continue to read some of Romans. And Paul addresses that in Romans 5. He addresses that he, in, in Romans 3. He addresses that and he says, the goal is not to keep on sinning. God forbid. That's not what I'm telling you. He said, what I'm telling you is that when we do sin, we have an advocate. When we do sin, we have, we have uh, um, one who made satisfaction on our behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. And so, grace, the grace of God, the grace of God. See, I, I was sharing with a young man just this weekend that uh, basically you have you have judgment, you have mercy, you have grace. Now, we're talking about law, and we're going to talk about love here in a second. But you've heard this before. Justice means the definition of justice is you get what you deserve. In justice, you get what you deserve. In mercy, you don't get what you deserve. But and in grace, you get what you don't deserve. So I'm going to say that again. Justice, if you get justice, you get what you deserve. If you get mercy, you don't get what you deserve. If you get grace, you get what you don't deserve. None of us deserve grace. We don't deserve it. And, and so we just, in humility, cry out to God and say, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. You saved me, a sinner. Save me, Lord, daily. Save me, Lord. And so, um, and, and, and I've been accused of teaching too much grace and, and not enough law. I'm telling you, I'm not dis discounting God's laws at all. We, it, 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 the laws are our boundary. We need the law, and the law actually convicts us. And makes, Matter of fact, it convicts us, and, and it, again, it's our teacher. The law is our teacher, and when we find out and humble enough to say, I can't do the law, it pushes us into Christ. There has to be another way. There has to be a way of salvation. There is. His name is Christ. And so John five thirty nine. I want you to read this. As I wrap this up, we're on third base. John five thirty nine. Jesus is speaking here. And, and I, I could just see him just I, kind of losing it and just kind of, uh, he says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. He says, you're studying the scriptures. You're studying the rules. You're studying the statutes and decrees and laws of God. You think that in studying all them, 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 them words on paper, that that's going to bring you life. He says, ah, you're missing it. Don't forget. All of that points to me. The law was our guardian. The law was our teacher. He says the scriptures point to me. He's talking about his personhood, the relationship. And so it is what it is. God loves you. And this is a problem right here. Um, it, it, let's say you're a Christian. And most Christians will... There's a debate about love, too much uh, law and grace, law and grace, too much love and too much grace. Uh, people are sinning and they're Christians. They can't do it. They're getting away with it. And it goes back and forth. Have you ever, we, we, what, you do, what, what happens when people are critical of this grace stuff, too critical and, and condemning of other Christians, they frustrate grace. They frustrate grace. Let me break this down for you and I'm almost done. Go to Galatians 2. Go to Galatians 2. Verse 20. And it says, I'm going to read the last two verses there. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, this is a big one. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What are you saying? I do not frustrate grace. This is what happens. This is how Christians, you can be a born again believer, spirit filled, and you can frustrate grace. I can frustrate grace. This is what it sounds like. Anytime you, you, you're you in, in a situation where you're thinking and feeling something just happened, you say, hey, that's not fair. Think about the times that you said, hey, that's not fair. Somebody cut in front of you. You're, you're in an amusement park and you're waiting in line and, and, and somebody, five people cut in front of you. You've been waiting 20, 30, 40 minutes, and you're like, hey, that's not fair. The line's back there. You're in traffic, and someone passes you up. You're all waiting to turn, but that one car goes zoom, 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 passes all these cars up and sneaks in. Hey, that's not fair. When you were a kid, you know, mom is cutting pieces of cake, and the piece of cake you got is smaller than your brother's piece. Hey, that's not fair. His piece is big. Maybe you got a spanking. And your sister did the same thing or your brother did the same thing and he didn't get a spanking. Hey, that's not fair. Maybe someone else got a promotion and you didn't and you weren't recognized for something. Hey, that's not fair. Maybe, uh, maybe someone can have children and you can't. And you say, hey, that's not fair. I, I know this young lady, she's not, this young lady, she said she absolutely wrestles in her mind with hate towards her sister. She says, because this woman cannot have babies. Yet she's saying my sister can get pregnant and she's had like three or four abortions in a row. I want babies and cannot have them. She can get pregnant, but doesn't want babies. And she says, that's not fair. Frustrating grace. Maybe there's a marriage that you're coveting. Maybe there's somebody else's husband that you're, you're, you're coveting somebody else's wife that you're coveting and you, and you want that. I, I had a young man years ago. Oh my God, I was still active duty. This young sergeant came to me and told me he could be a better husband to my wife, Sandy. It, it, it happened. I just looked at him like, you're all kind of a moron. You're, you're an idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about. He said that he could be a better husband and a better daddy to my three children. Who the, who says that? Who, what are you thinking? Are you psycho? What's wrong with you? The point here is we frustrate grace when we say things like, hey, that's not fair. Let me translate what you what happens when you say that's not fair. When you say and, and proclaim that's not fair, what you're asking for is justice. When you say, I want justice, which means, let me translate that, justice, which means you want law which means you leave grace and you frustrate grace. Let me connect those dots again. Hey, that's not fair. Hey, I want justice. Hey, I want law. Hey, I just left grace. That's how easy it is to depart from the grace of God. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about his grace. Does that make sense? Man, God is so good. So if you want to know where you're at on a scale of whether you're a law-based Christian or a love-based Christian, because there's there's the love of law and there's the law of love for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for us. His son overcame the law because now it's about relationship. If you're in this relationship with Christ, the law is a secondary to you. I'm not discounting the laws. I'm, I'm, I'm prioritizing the relationship. This is huge. And so if you want to know where you're at on this, because again, the big debate is, as I, as I wrap this up, and we're stealing home right now. We're rounding third. We're going to steal home. What happens? This is a revealing question because um, there are Christians who love the law, and there are Christians who love the law of love. There's a love of law versus the law of love. The law of love is what it's all about. Love, love. Oh, man, that's another conversation. So here's how you can find out where you're at. Real simple. You need to ask yourself an answer because we all, as Christians, we know we're supposed to obey God's laws. Well, all of us are supposed to obey God's laws. The question is, why do you obey God's laws? And I hear people all the time say things like, because I have to, or because I don't want to go to hell. 
you're revealing the level of relationship and intimacy. You're describing the relationship you have with the Lord. I'm only obeying him because I have to. I'm only obeying him because I don't want to go to hell. But it's very rare when you hear somebody say, well, I obey him because I love him. I'm in love with him. I, don't, I, I, I go to great lengths to protect this and guard this. It's, it's kind of like me getting married to Sandy when we were dating. And then I go to her and I say, okay, um, plan A, as I propose this to you before we get married, plan A is I'm going to uh, take care of you. I'm going to be faithful to you because I have to. We're setting down some rules, right? We're setting down some laws for our marriage. And that's plan A. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to be faithful to you because I have to. And versus plan B, I'm going to take care of you. I'll be faithful to you because I love you. Ten years goes by and because she's going to take plan B. But ten years goes by and I committed adultery. And I had an extramarital affair. And I go to her and I, and I say, Sandy, I am so sorry. I'm so Sandy. I'm so sorry, Sandy. I, I broke the rules. I broke the law. Is that true? It is true. I broke the rule. I broke the law in our relationship. But what's more true? I really broke her heart. And so that, that, that that's a different level of relationship and understanding. And so when we sin, it, it, it's I'm telling you right now, you're. Your repentance should not be, oh, Father, oh, God, I've broken your laws. Oh, God, I've broken your laws. That's one way to pray. And I get it. And if you're there, that's where you're at. Because even the psalmist did that. But that was all before Christ. And now with Christ, it's like, God, I didn't just break your laws. I broke your heart. God, I keep violating the relationship. I'm sorry. The laws are a done deal because of what Christ did. So there's that. You have to ask yourself, why do you obey God's laws? That makes sense? Amen. Well, look, I got to wrap this up. Just a quick video. This is all my heart. I had to get this thing out. Um, let me pray for you guys. Father, I pray for these people right now, Lord. <clears throat> I declare that these men and women devote themselves to prayer. They have alert minds and, and they have thankful hearts. But this is Colossians 4. And Father, I, I pray that you give them many opportunities to speak about your mysterious plan concerning Christ. And I pray, Father, that these men and women proclaim this message as clearly as they should. And Father, I declare that these men and women live wisely among non-believers and they make the most of every opportunity that you give them. Father, I declare that their conversation is always gracious and attractive so they have the right response for everyone. Father, I, I pray Ephesians 5:15 over them, Father, and I declare that these men and women look carefully at how they walk, not as unwise, but as wise. They make the best use of the time you've given them because they know the days are evil. Father, these men and women are not foolish and they understand your will, Father. And so they quickly carry out the tasks assigned to you by the one who sends, Lord. The, 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 the tasks assigned to these men and women by you, Father. You're the one who sends. And so, Father, because they understand that night is coming and no one can work, they get to work now. And so, Father, I, I pray Jude 1 into their hearts and lives right now, Father. And I declare that these men and women will defend the faith that God, that you have entrusted once and for all time to his holy people. Your holy people, that's us, Lord. And, Father, we're going to defend that faith. And, Father, I thank you that we work heartily for you, Lord, and not for men. And, you know, um, Father, we know that uh, we're going to receive from you, Lord, an inheritance as our reward when we diligently serve you and seek you, Lord. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that we purpose in our hearts to serve you and fear you alone. We obey your commands and we listen to your voice and we cling to you, Father. That's Deuteronomy 13, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Father, I thank you that these men and women are steadfast. They are immovable. They always abound in the work of the Lord and they know that their labor in the Lord is never in vain. In Jesus' name, amen. So bottom line, I'm out of here. Uh, it's been a long time since I've cut these videos and I'm going to try to do more of them, little 10, 15, 20 minute videos. Uh, share your thoughts. Share some throwbacks. The, hit the comments. Like this video. Share this video. Um, as you go, give somebody high five. Look around, give somebody high five and tell them, don't frustrate the grace of God. God bless you.